just months after journalist Jamal Khashoggi was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, another Arab dissident says his life is also in danger. Iyad el-Baghdadi is a pro-democracy activist and strong critic of Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The UK's Guardian newspaper reported that Norwegian officials took him from his home in Oslo to a secure location. There he was told the CIA had warned Norway's government that the Saudis had him in their crosshairs. El Baghdadi gained popularity during the Arab Spring when he posted pro-human rights messages on social media. The Palestinian activist was granted asylum in Norway four years ago after being expelled from the United Arab Emirates for his criticism of Middle Eastern regimes. I'm Jonah Hull in Oslo. In an exclusive interview, Iyad el-Baghdadi discusses an unlikely friendship with the murdered Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi and how continuing Khashoggi's work has brought him into the crosshairs of the Saudi government. Human rights campaigner Iyad el-Baghdadi talks to Al Jazeera. Iyad el-Baghdadi, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to go back uh, a couple of weeks now to the 25th of April when you first got the knock on your door here in Oslo uh, telling you that there was a threat against you. How did you react? How did it happen? Well, to be honest, I, I wasn't that surprised that they showed up. Um, and I believe the first thing I said to them uh, once they introduced themselves, showed me their badges, was something like, what took you so long? Uh, I remember on that day, you know, from the corner of my eye, I could see some activity outside. I could see that I think they were standing there for a while. Uh, it seemed to me that they secured the area before asking me to, to go with them. The no Norwegian security? The Norwegian side. security. The, the, in Norway, we call them the PST. Uh, they're kind of a combination of Norway's, uh, you know, kind of CIA, FBI, and security, you know, uh, you know um, uh, special service, you can say. So they also provide security for uh, politicians and, you know, dignitaries. Uh, and they're known to be, you know, highly professional, highly competent. Um, so, at the time, of course, they were they were in plain clothes. And what did they tell you? Uh, they didn't tell me any details on the spot. They simply asked me to go with them. They didn't give you any sense of why there was a threat against you or where information had come from. Uh, they they only did that once I was safe and secure in that s special s secure location. And at that mentioned. point, what did they say? Uh, they simply sat me down and then they told me that they received a tip from a partner intelligence agency indicating that I've been, I'm, I'm the target of a threat. And you now believe that to be the CIA and the threat to be coming from yes. so, Saudi Arabia? Yes, so at the time I had a good, um, I had a good uh, uh, idea that it was the CIA but I wasn't 100% sure. I, I believe I only this only was completely confirmed uh, when The Guardian did uh, you know, the work to confirm it. And in the absence of, of real evidence to support this notion of a threat, what gives you pause to think that it is credible, that there is a real threat out there? Well, uh, to start, I think the CIA is, you know, whether, wh whatever you think about the CIA from a moral point of view, I believe uh, everyone would agree that they are competent. Um, so I don't believe that the CIA would have passed uh, a tip if, if there wasn't something uh, behind it. Uh, but I should also mention that uh, I started to become concerned about my security as far back as October, um, you know, shortly after Jamal's murder, Jamal Khashoggi's murder. On October 15th, I received a friendly tip uh, from a Saudi source uh, indicating that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being discussed mm. and that I should uh, be concerned about my security. Um, he mentioned other names as well, um, and, you know, I also informed them. Um, but I didn't take uh, any, you know, drastic action back then. Um, in February, while I was working with Bezos' uh, investigation team, I became, I mean, I, I started to understand how sensitive that matter is, and I started to feel, I mean, revisiting a lot of my old sources, etc. cetera, um, I started to uh, feel that, um, I mean, I don't want to be too dramatic, but I felt like, you know, I have, I probably have crosshairs on my back. Mm. Um, and I did uh, indicate my concern to a number of Norwegian friends, um, you know, in, in an email that went around, asking them for advice. You know, what you know, someone who's in this kind of situation, what do you do? Where, where do you go? Um, in March, I filed a police report with the Oslo police, with the local police, 
which is the normal procedure when you want to, you know, when you in want to indicate something like that. But I believe it was over a month, um, over a month had passed before uh, the PST came to my door. So it was October last year, the same month that Jamal Khashoggi was killed, that you began to feel somewhat under threat yourself. Yeah. You were friends with him, were you not? Yeah. And you worked together. Well, yeah. I mean, initially, of course, I mean, I tell people that uh, someone like Jamal and I are not supposed to be friends. We're not supposed to be friends. The reason is Jamal, for the longest time, was one of the elites of Saudi Arabia. He was a figure who was deeply loyal, uh, and he continued to be deeply loyal to the Saudi uh, state, uh, to the idea of Saudi Arabia. Um, and for the longest time, I mean, within my team, we had a lot of frustration. We had rants about Jamal Khashoggi, you know, like the guy who almost gets it, the guy who would say 10 things, 10 positive, you know, 10 things about democracy and human rights and free expression. Nine of them would be things that you would absolutely, you know, agree with, and the 10th would walk it all back, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so uh, I was always skeptical about Jamal until um, that moment when he chose exile. Mm -hmm. Um, and something really amazing happened after that, which is that once Jamal was unshackled um, from uh, having to be concerned about his security and about his, uh, you know, his, his, his safety, once he was safe, uh, reasonably, in the United States, um, he could have gone in any direction. He could have gone towards, you know, he could have, one of his dreams was to start his own TV station. He could have done that. He, he could have, you know, uh, gotten a, a pretty decent uh, position at a think tank, for example, in D.C. Hmm. Eventually, he chose two things. First is journalism, his first, uh, you know, his first uh, identity. And he gravitated towards activists. Uh, Jamal was used to to some kind of normal politics. He, he was used to the old Saudi Arabia, which had some kind of norms and some kind of you know, traditions of how things happen. Uh, MBS completely destroyed that. And, and the end of normal politics eventually meant that you have to seek other ways of seeking influence. And, and I think that's how he, that's when he started to gravitate towards activism. MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, of course, the crown prince yeah. in Saudi Arabia. Um, eventually, you found common cause with Jamal Khashoggi. Do, do you think that it was your association with him uh, that first put you on the radar of the Saudi authorities? To attempt to answer your question, um, we did a risk assessment and we identified six or seven uh, reasons or six or seven things that I've been working on. You and he? Uh, not with Jamal, I mean generally. I mean, yes. uh, three of these or two of these were, were with Jamal, but the rest were basically other initiatives that were highly sensitive. Um, and I believe uh, from my own you know, informed uh, opinion uh, would have been highly um, you know, of concern, let's say, to, to, to the Saudis. Well, you knew, you knew that what you were doing had the potential to get you in trouble. You tweeted, uh, if they don't want to kill me, then I'm not doing my job. So is, is the risk, the danger, something that you accept as simply being in, inherent in what you do? It, it, it is something that I accept. I mean, uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's not the easiest life, uh, but it is the life that I built and it's the life that I chose. So let's talk about the period then after uh, Jamal Khashoggi's death uh, in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul last October. You took on uh, along with Omar Abdelaziz, who's also been warned at the same time as you. He lives in Canada. There's another individual who lives in the United States, also warned by security services uh, of a threat. Uh, the three of you took on Jamal's work and tried to carry it on. Uh, and that's what brought you into contact with the Amazon founder, Jeff Bezos. Give me a sense of, of how events unfolded after Jamal's death and, and how they involved your work. Yeah, so Jamal was very concerned about the state of free expression. The main medium of free expression in the Arab world post-2011 was uh, social media, uh, particularly Twitter. I think the nature of Twitter, uh, the fact that Twitter is this unfiltered, you know, there's no algorithm, or at least the algorithm is very light, uh, and the fact that Twitter became very, very popular in Saudi Arabia. You know, I think Saudi Arabia in certain, in certain, uh, you know, um, certain surveys tops the world when it comes to penetration rate, uh, when it comes to Twitter. Um, 
Jamal himself was a Twitter influencer, as you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had, I think, 1.6 million Huge or following. something like that. 1.7 million followers, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm nowhere near his influence on, on Twitter. I mean, and, and uh, keep in mind also that he's influential in the Arabic language, which is a language that, for safety, uh, I, I avoided. Even though I enjoy speaking, I mean, and, and communicating in Arabic, it just happens that they were far more uh, aggressive with Arabic speakers because they wanted to control the Arabic public sphere. Okay, so you identify Twitter as the sort of main battleground, as it were. It's the main like battleground. It. The main, uh, I mean, uh, I remember as far back as 2011, someone uh, called Twitter the Parliament of the Arabs. It is where Arabs go to express their opinion. It is where Arabs go to, uh, to get informed. To say and the things that they can't say. Exactly, openly. exactly. So take me on in how you went about picking up where Jamal left off, trying to finish what it was he'd started. Yeah, so uh, you might be aware of the project that Omar Abdul Aziz was working on. And of course, this is a project that, um, that was started in association with Jamal Khashoggi. Um, and the idea behind it is, you know, these guys, the Saudi regime, they weaponize Twitter, they manipulate the medium, they manipulate the, the platform uh, in order to do really dark things and to justify really dark things. Why don't we do the same, but in the, in the opposite direction? In other words, why don't we also manipulate Twitter to push our own narratives, which are basically you know, pro-freedom, pro-freedom pro of expression, pro-human rights, etc. cetera. Um, so that was one line of attack. Uh, and I would, I would mention here that I have a certain philosophical difference, let's say, with this approach. Uh, of course, I was not involved in that project at all. Uh, but I have this philosophical difference because I think uh, maybe fighting fire with fire is not the best strategy because they simply have so much more fire. Mm. Um, the second uh, approach, I mean, th there's three approaches. I, I prefer not to mention the third approach, at least uh, for the meanwhile, because it's very much a work in progress and it's highly sensitive uh, and it's uh, starting to bear fruit. Um, but I, I would mention the second one, where the second one basically was uh, um, Jamal's desire to create um, what we eventually came to, to, to describe as an Arab state media watchdog. So he actually gave me a call. I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, August 7th. Um, and this was after after we had communicated about the third project and after I had made some connections that, uh, that, that he needed. Uh, but in that conversation, he, he summarized the idea. He said, you know, uh, these guys um, push a lot of propaganda. A lot of it is outrageous. And a lot of it, uh, they get away with it because they say it in the Arabic language and there isn't enough awareness in the world that, you know, this is actually happening. So he's like, why don't we create this project that actually exposes this? So, so what they do is that they segment the audience. So they send a message in English, they send another message in Arabic. Why don't we cross-translate so that people can see that this is what's happening and we can actually keep an eye, a spotlight, on their propaganda efforts, uh, what they're doing, what they're saying, etc. Mm. He said, like, some, some of it will be funny uh, in a dark kind of way, like, like look how, how you know, ridiculous this is. And some of it would be incredibly important, incredibly important for, um, you know, uh, for understanding, you know, the, these regimes. And of course, he talked about this not only to me, but also to the third uh, unnamed uh, uh, person. In the United States. In the United States. Uh, and of course, I understood from my, like from my subsequent, uh, you know, uh, work on this, I understood that Twitter is an integral part of such a project. So it wasn't, it, it, it does, doesn't have to be simply TV and, uh, and press. Twitter is an enormous, it's, it's actually the primary uh, uh, propaganda tool uh, for, you know, when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Mm. Uh, and they've, exp they, they've spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and they actually spilled a lot of blood mm. to, to maintain, to create that kind of control, uh, which they're actually they're very proud of. And we have a lot of evidence that they're very proud of their, the degree of control that they have over Arabic Twitter. What, what do you mean they spilled a lot of blood? Uh, I mean that there are people, and I, I mean I can't mention names here, but I think soon enough this this will be this this will come out. Uh, first of all, a lot of the people who were arrested as early as September 2017, uh, of course they had a profile as intellectuals. Some of them were scholars, etc. But I think it's also important to note that they also were Twitter influencers. In fact, we tabulated. I mean, uh, we, we had so an effort. Forgive me, you're talking yeah. about the Saudi authorities. Saudi authorities killing people who had become influential on Twitter. 
Uh, I mean, Jamal was one of them, but there were in the, there, there are cases that we're aware of, of people who were tortured to death, and not to, not to go into names, uh, but tortured to death, and we cannot find anything that they were doing other than Twitter. And this is evidence-backed? Uh, unfortunately, yes. And we don't have, uh, as I mentioned, we don't, uh, we don't want to reveal the names yet, uh, you know, un until we have something official. Uh, we're expecting that maybe th there will be an official uh, um, uh, acknowledgement mm. of this uh, at some point. But there has been reporting on it. Okay. So Twitter is your battleground in which you and people like you operate to counter the propaganda of regimes, among them Saudi Arabia. Jamal Khashoggi is killed. You and two others take on projects that you were working with together. Uh, bring, bring me then up to the point where you're working with Jeff Bezos and you begin to feel vulnerable. Yeah, so the, the, the general idea uh, or the general methodology um, of the second project is something that we had an idea about what, what we never had, a tar like we never uh, tried it out in a real life investigation. Uh, this of course kind of changed when the Bezos blackmail scandal uh, became public. The founder of Amazon. So the founder of Amazon and also interestingly and uh, importantly the owner of the Washington Post. Well, owner of, the employer of Khashoggi. Yeah. Uh, his phone was tapped allegedly, uh, embarrassing tweets, emails. Uh, messages well, it's, lifted it's, off it's, it. it's ma mainly uh, you know pictures and messages that mm. were lifted off mm. uh, his phone um, and I, I mean I, I don't want to get into details that uh, probably I should not mention I mean mm. there's a lot I can I know about the case that um, that I, sh I should not be um, uh, I should not be speaking publicly about mm. uh, but the short story here is that uh, Jeff Bezos um, after the murder of uh, of uh, Washington Post journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi was in a bit of a bind because this is a man who has has extensive business interests in Saudi Arabia. He had uh, by then a personal relationship with MBS. He had met him several times. Bezos. Yes. Bezos. Um, but he was also the owner of the Washington Post. Mm. And uh, MBS just killed one of his journalists. Uh, and he was in this uh, kind of situation where it was clear, it, was, it became clear to us even, even more um, you know, with the investigation, that MBS expected Bezos to side with him over the Washington Post and to say, you know, you know, my business comes first, um, and you know, I have I have this personal relationship with, uh, with with this man, and he expected him to curb the Washington Post coverage. That, of course, did not happen. And Jeff Bezos, basically, when he bought the Washington Post in 2013, he had a good faith agreement that I'm not going to interfere in editorial policy at mm, all. I'm mm, not going mm. to enter the editorial room. Mm. And he honored that. And this was something the Saudis this was like. something Exactly. This was something that MBS saw as betrayal. And so you were called in to help identify the source of the leaks. My role was basically aiding the investigation team in uh, uh, first of all, exposing the degree and the, uh, the, 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 the Saudi campaigns against Jeff Bezos, uh, but also um, the timing of a lot of these things that happened. Uh, and of course, it fell upon Jeff Bezos' investigation team to actually go in and find out exactly what happened. And it was conclusive? Uh, well, that was there, I mean, according, I mean, to quote them, or to, to paraphrase, they concluded with a high degree of certainty, uh, that's, what I'm, I'm, that's, that's according to them, mm. that uh, the Saudis had access to Jeff Bezos's phone. So there's a lot of work going on here uh, on your behalf, Omar Abdulaziz and, and the other individual in the United States, following on from Jamal's work, aiming to point the figure, finger, not just at the Saudi authorities, but at MBS himself, the Crown Prince himself. One yes. thing that seems to be lacking, in, indeed also lacking in pointing the finger at MBS in the death of Jamal Khashoggi, is firm, categorical, undeniable evidence Direct of evidence. his own involvement. Yes. Yes. Yet you take it as read, you speak as though it is a fact-based um, thing. If there is no direct evidence, mustn't you and others accept that there is the possibility that MBS, in fact, did not have any direct role or well, knowledge that, that's, that's of any really, of these things? I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, some people misunderstand circumstantial evidence or the, the actual idea of circumstantial evidence. I mean, if I walk out 
if I'm out in, uh, outside and you're sitting inside and I walk in and I have, you can see that I'm wet, you can assume that it was raining outside and I have an umbrella, for example. You can assume that it was raining, but that was not direct evidence, it's circumstantial. It doesn't mean that it's weak evidence. It simply means that it's not direct. In a case of, as I said uh, before, uh, a highly opaque regime, which has uh, control over information, it is very rare that you will actually find direct evidence. Maybe it, would, it could be years before you find direct evidence. And this is something they know, and this is something they, they, they use uh, to, as I said, you know, run loops around us, really. I mean, they can, they can basically be months or, or running years ahead of us, uh, which unfortunately, in many cases, they have, they mm -hmm. have been. I would point out, however, that in a country like Saudi Arabia, with, which is ruled by an absolute monarch, and he's, and he's absolutely, uh, probably, I don't think there's another country in the world in which uh, uh, one person has such direct control over everything in the state. It is simply impossible to think that um, such, uh, such a thing as Jamal's murder could have been done without his knowledge. Hmm. And this was, in fact, the conclusion of the CIA. To a medium to, to high to level of probability. Absolutely. I, think, I mean, words, the, I mean yeah. the, what the, ar the argument they use is that it is, it is almost impossible for something like this to happen without mm. MBS's knowledge. And yet all of this said, and with all the cumulative work that you and others uh, continue to do, uh, it remains an unassailable fact that MBS at this point, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince, retains the uh, support of President Trump. Yep. The banks and the investors who pulled away from Saudi Arabia very publicly in the months following Jamal's murder have trickled back. There's simply too much money there for them not to. The spotlight shifts inexorably to Saudi Arabia's foe, Iran, in the Arab world. And so it is unlikely, or seems unlikely, that MBS is ever going to go the way of the uh, Mubaraks or the Gaddafis or the Omar al-Bashirs of this world. Is that true, do you think? I mean, I think that the chances of a popular uprising in Saudi Arabia is not, as, as, as you mentioned, is not, uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't have a history uh, of popular uprisings. But then again, I mean, Libya, for example, didn't have one. Um, Syria, until recent, recently, I mean, d didn't, didn't have one. Um, so I, I would caution against, uh, you know, being uh, complacent about, about, you know, what is that point at which the people simply say enough. However, I completely agree with you on everything else. The fact that uh, the administration in, the, in this world that is most capable of reigning in MBS is currently his biggest enabler. Uh, I'm talking about Trump, but also importantly, Jared Kushner. Um, I mean, my own sources uh, indicate that U.S. institutions, uh, including Intel, including uh, you know Congress, obviously, are very much aware that MBS is bad news. But then there's the other angle, which is that Saudi Arabia is verifiably, absolutely, an important country. It will continue to be an important country. So this presents a very interesting policy conundrum, really, to the world, which is that we need Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's an interesting market. It's also an important country for strategic reasons. Uh, dynamic young population, you know, traumatized probably after after the recent events, but still important. But then we also have this guy who is bad news. What do we do about it? I mean, this is this is absolutely a conundrum. Your current situation at the moment, under threat. You're aware of a threat. How do you proceed now, undeterred or cautiously? Um, well, on the one hand, uh, it's clear, I mean, the fact that there's, there's, there's been this threat, and you mentioned, you quoted me earlier saying, you know, if they don't want to kill me, then I'm not doing my job. Mm. Uh, in a way, when they come after you, that's when you know that you're being effective. Uh, you know that uh, you hit a nerve, in other words. Um, you know, they, they uh, of course, again, I mean, they went after a lot of people uh, that were a lot more accessible to them, such as people who are living in Saudi Arabia. And these people, of course, um, I'm, um, you know, I have the highest respect for their courage, uh, but also the, the biggest, the most concern for their safety. Mm. Um, but knowing that you have uh, a certain effectiveness that would prompt them to try to, to, to deter you and to stop you, uh, really is validation. It's validation and it's basically a message saying that, uh, you know, I, I need to double down my efforts. Yeah, no, but Dali. 
That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for Thank talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.